Before we get into today's episode, I'm sure many of you know it is Black Friday and obviously the merch shop is finally back just in time for the shopping season. Make sure you go to multilevelmerch.shop to check out all the new designs. And while you're there, you'll probably check out that we are doing 25% off through this Black Friday weekend, but because I know not everyone gets paid this Friday, I'm extending it through next Saturday, December 3rd, so that even if you get paid next Friday, you're still gonna have the opportunity to be able to get in on those amazing deals. I'm gonna be donating a portion of every single sale to the Trevor Project as well. So if you have the extra change and you like something in there, please make sure to give it a purchase. In this gloomy, depressing world that we live in, who doesn't love animal rescue videos, right? The stakes are high, knowing that a poor, innocent animal is in danger, like a kitten found in a trash heap or covered in bugs. But there's always a happy ending when you get to see that adorable, defenseless kitten purring a few minutes later. Or maybe you come across a video of a little sparrow without any feathers yet, fallen from its nest. Seeing a couple raise it and watching that little bird grow up in the span of three minutes, it's just a good feeling. These are the restore your faith in humanity kinds of videos that we all love to see. The Dodo is without a doubt, one of the biggest names in curating this wholesome content. Years ago, an article on Viduli claimed that they were changing the animal content landscape. Not only were they ruling over the pet industry, but the media and entertainment industry as a whole. They captivate audiences with everything from stories of heroism to animal Halloween costumes. Now with over 12 million subscribers, they're still probably one of the biggest, most recognizable names in pet and wildlife content. Chances are, if you just click on one of their random videos or blogs, you won't notice anything alarming right away. Like, come on, who doesn't wanna see dogs forming a sweet friendship and playing on a beach together or a mama dog getting a spa day? It's adorable. However, the more you watch, you might start to notice something just a little bit off about their videos. There's one which a family rescues a baby blue jay, but looking at the blue jay, you've got to wonder why it needed rescuing. Desiree, the mom in the video, claims that it fell from a nest, but the bird does have its feathers and it doesn't appear injured in any way either. From what I found online and through resources like the Cornell Lab, these birds are fledglings. They're not able to fly yet, but they've just left the nest and they're in that limbo situation. You know, the one where they can kind of hop and flit about, but they haven't fully figured out the whole flying thing yet. It's the awkward in-between stage like puberty and high school. It's, It's just real awkward for the birds. So the parents are still feeding it every so often. And unless you notice that little bird is being neglected or is injured, you know, just kind of leave it be. Let nature do its thing, let the bird mature. And if you do see cause for alarm, then you should call a wildlife rehabilitator instead of caring for it yourself. But this family featured on the Dodo didn't do any of that. Desiree does claim to have a nature sanctuary. So maybe she is a licensed rehabilitator, but that's not made clear to us, the audience. And Dodo does not present any nuance in their video either. They don't explain that you're supposed to leave fledglings alone and why this young blue jay was an exception to that rule. You might say that, hey, this was just supposed to be a cute video. It's not that deep. But even according to the Lehrer family who launched the Dodo in the first place, they want to be seen as a source of journalism for animals. Izzy Lehrer explains, there's a growing readiness and willingness to listen to people who speak about issues concerning animals, and the Dodo will provide a home for these kinds of conversations. So the question then is, why didn't the Dodo spark this conversation about people mistakenly rescuing fledglings? Why continue to perpetuate a falsehood? And maybe you're thinking, this is just one video. It's just one mistake. And if that were the case, this wouldn't be an episode. They'll promote a hamster being friends with a cat, a polar bear petting a sled dog, and use themselves as a source for their research or even rely on PETA for information. When you take a deeper look, the dodo seems willing to sacrifice the well-being of animals for the sake of cuteness and ultimately for the sake of their wallets. Hello and welcome to The Corporate Casket. I'm the Illuminati and today we're talking about the dodo. Please know that this episode will mention animal death and though I will try not to get into any graphic detail, I recommend skipping this episode in its entirety if you're gonna find that particularly upsetting today. Now, with that out of the way, I'd like to start by chatting about the very obvious and blatant issues that many people have with them, how they promote dangerous animal relationships. Now, there are two ways in which this is done. 
The first is their Odd Couples series, which you might see something like a dog interacting with a horse or maybe a cat with a chicken. You never really know what you're gonna get. The second way is how humans interact with wildlife and how they promote regular everyday individuals bringing in a baby deer or fox or you know what have you into their home. Both of these can pose serious issues. So we're gonna go ahead and start with the first one, odd couples. Now in one Dodo blog, they promote the Instagram account of the Utah family, which features posts of their hamster cuddling up with their cat or dog. And I really don't think I should have to explain in detail why this is not a great idea, but here we go anyway for the sake of explaining, I suppose. Now, even if your cat or dog has a low prey drive and doesn't seem interested in attacking your hamster, you can't actually be 100% certain that they won't change their mind. And you're very likely causing your hamster unneeded stress by putting it in that scenario in the first place. Almost any resource that you look into about hamsters says this, and I was actually really like just shocked by just how open and easily available that information is. Now, I do not own hamsters, uh, never have, never will probably. It's just not the pet for me, that's okay. But one of my writers on staff does have a hamster named Ham, very adorable, might I add, and they know a lot about hamsters. So when we started to take a look at the dodo, this was like one of the top of mind things for them to bring up was like, hey, did you know? And I was like, no, I did not know. So when we dug into it and looked at a whole bunch of sources for how to take care of a hamster and everything, this was kind of like a big obvious thing, like don't bring your hamster around other larger pets, they're terrified. Now, those that say hamsters and cats can live in harmony talk about how you can train the two animals to tolerate one another and be okay in the same room, but not how to get them to cuddle. And truthfully, this just comes down to basic biology. Cats are predators, hamsters are prey. I'm sorry, that's just the way it is, unfortunately. The cute pictures really are not worth putting your hamster's life in danger. The dodo does the same thing with reptiles too, though. They show cats and bearded dragons as best friends, the cat even batting them around with their paws. And again, risking your animal's life isn't worth a cute video. Cat scratches can be especially dangerous for reptiles, by the way, because of the bacteria in their bites. So it would only take one attack for a potential infection. As one bearded dragon site puts it, prevention is always better than cure. You're far better off not allowing them to interact in the first place. And again, it's not as if this information is hard to come by like at all. Victoria Rachel is well known in the hamster community and has a whole episode dedicated to explaining how she keeps her hamsters safe from her cats and how they do not interact whatsoever. At the end of that episode, she says that, If anything, if you can get away with your cat not ever knowing you even have a hamster. And frankly, all of this is just the basic standard of care. Do not let your cats near your prey animal pets. If Dodo is so intent on posting that kind of content, then they also can't consider themselves a valuable and informative resource. You can't really have it both ways. Claim to like care about the well-being of animals and promoting that, while at the same time promoting really not healthy situations for your pets. Now let's move on to the second point, wild animals being given questionable or woefully inadequate care. One woman featured on Dodo at least three times, by the way, brought a beaver into her home. Yes, she tried to rehabilitate a beaver in a bathtub. I am not fucking kidding. She knew that beavers don't belong in a house. I feel most of us know that too. Um, He was literally eating her tables and drywall, but she brought him into the home anyway. If she's an experienced wildlife rehabilitator, why not bring him somewhere more suitable? And if that wasn't an option, why wouldn't the Dodo make that clearer? Again, it just feels more like, Oh, wow, cute beaver took over the priority of a wild animal's needs. For the record, a pond was eventually built for the beaver named JB, but it's kind of clear that a pattern is starting to emerge here. In another case, a young woman saved a wild American robin, though she doesn't have the experience or license to do so. And again, while her story has a happy ending, and to be frank, I don't think the Dodo would really feature many stories where there aren't happy endings, The robin goes on to live near her house and in the wild, others just don't. Commenters on these videos claim that when they try to save wild birds, they end up choking them and inadvertently killing them. The dodo making the impression that rescuing animals is so easy that anyone could do it is just not the reality and it sets a pretty dangerous precedent. A change.org petition from licensed rescuers pleads with the public to sign it, to tell dodo to stop encouraging this kind of care. In part, it reads, It's equally concerning how many commenters admit to trying to save a wild bird or animal themselves. 
many descriptions amount to what is considered imprinting behaviors and even behaviors that translate to stress. One commenter even shared how their imprinted wild bird followed them around the yard until it was run over and died. Those who truly care about wild bird or animal welfare should give them their best chance. Not only are people actually trying and failing to rescue wild birds, but they're even breaking the law by doing so. Migratory birds like the American robin are protected under federal law, making it illegal to attempt to rehabilitate this injured or orphaned wildlife without proper permits. I've got no idea just how many people featured on the dodo have these kinds of credentials, but if the dodo is so intent on becoming a valuable source, shouldn't they be the ones explaining this? Shouldn't they put some kind of, please don't try this at home warning on episodes? If you really give a shit about helping wildlife, there are many fantastic ways to do it. You can volunteer for a licensed rehabilitator near you for starters, and you'll know that you're getting an education and experience to aid animals in the right way. Overall, I think this speaks volumes when wildlife rehabilitators are speaking out against the dodo. In a way, it says that they've failed in their mission. The public might love the cute content, but when you have people directly involved in a community telling you that you're causing more harm than good, I think it's time to look inward. I've seen cancer survivors speak out against Think Pink. People with autism speak out against Autism Speaks. And now wildlife rehabilitators speak out against the dodo. Not all are doing harm on the same level or in the same way, but they're all lacking basic self-awareness of the community they claim they're trying to help. Unfortunately, their involvement in the wildlife community goes deeper than being oblivious. It can be misinformative and dangerous too. The dodo really loves to assign human characteristics to animals. And on the surface, this isn't a big deal. I mean, who doesn't love Bojack Horseman, right? Or maybe it's just me. Maybe I'm the only depressed one, but you get me. But seriously, we all see language all the time about how dogs will give a guilty look if they've been caught sneaking food off of counters or tearing up something they shouldn't. Or even recently on Twitter, I posted a photo of Casper because he looked like he was so mad at me for asking him to come back inside after it had snowed. I get it, I do it too. However, did you know it actually can be harmful to an extent? Like if you think your dog actually knows what it's done and you get angry and punish them, then that's not a good thing. But the Dodo takes this one step further. They actually published an article and viral video a while back showing a polar bear petting a sled dog. And I say petting in quotation marks here. Apparently they said that even a polar bear couldn't resist petting such a cute dog, which isn't a lie, but it's a pretty messed up lie to perpetuate when the polar bear actually ate the dog afterwards. They missed that detail. The owner of the sled dogs used to actually feed the polar bears on their property in Canada. And the one night they hadn't, the polar bear decided it would find its own meal. Not only was the owner, Brian Ledoon, wildly irresponsible here, but according to the Washington Post, he was quote, a target of animal rights activists and conservationists who decry his chaining of dogs and luring of polar bears for tourist photo ops. But I guess since the polar bear and the doggo were just so freaking adorable together, that made it all fine with the dodo. Who needs context when you have cuteness? That apparently seems to be the dodo's motto. Because rather than, you know, maybe not publishing this video, which is literally that dog's last moments alive, you could like, you know, maybe not promote this kind of stuff, you know, not share this kind of information, stop perpetuating the idea that odd couples can be a thing with animals. I find it incredibly tone deaf personally that they actually post this video going, oh my God, look, the polar bear is petting the dog. Well, they damn well know the dog was eaten afterwards. The dog was being petted to tenderize for a tasty fucking polar bear snack. Like it's, it's fucking horrific. And speaking on that whole petting that I said was in quotation marks, Wildlife biologist Tom Smith said that bears tend to ask questions with their teeth and paws, and that this polar bear was basically asking the question if their food was ready when they pet the dog. Sure, bears are highly trainable and food motivated. So if Ladoon was feeding them, then it makes sense that these different species could peacefully coexist for brief periods of time. But as Ladoon himself said, one day they didn't feed the bear and it turned on them. And this is kind of why we have wildlife laws in the first place. It's why feeding the bears is illegal. And it's why I believe the dodo shouldn't promote illegal activity with wildlife. And you know what? Maybe for a moment we can give them the benefit of the doubt. Maybe they didn't know where this footage came from. That is a distinct possibility. But if a wildlife biologist can look at this and go, oh yeah, that's obviously not petting, then the dodo could have probably done the same, especially when they claim to have all these resources and tried to be a resource themselves, 
you'd think they'd have the expertise to know this. I'd hate to think that some dog is going to get hurt or killed because their owner thinks that they could get along with a fucking bear, and yet it happened. Now, the Dodo eventually did remove this footage and said the viral video isn't cute at all once they learned of the incident. I tried to dig into how they treat animals now and if this level of humanizing animals has continued, and frustratingly enough, they have so much conflicting information out there, which I found obviously very interesting. For example, in a 2015 article, they say that by giving an animal human traits, you're showing it empathy. Saying that an animal may be sad to have lost its pups is showing compassion, and the word anthropomorphize itself is a way to demean or even mock empathy. Then just mere months later, they had an article come out called Your Fur Baby is Just a Dog. And they say there's nothing wrong with someone who sees their pet as exactly that, a pet and not a baby. You don't have to see an animal as human to love it and care about it. This author even has the insight to write, quote, although language like baby and fur kid doesn't necessarily do any harm, we should be careful that it isn't leading to a distorted picture of what our dogs really are and ironically making it more difficult to create the kind of environment they need to thrive. We can and should see a dog as an animal without minimizing our love for them or our obligations to the ones that we take into our lives and our hearts. And while that is a great point to make, absolutely. And it's a point that just unfortunately literally contradicts their previous article. Most recently, they've actually explained what this term means and why it's harmful too, just days prior to researching this episode actually. So five years ago, it was a dirty word, one that means you're unempathetic, but now it's fine. Now it means you're educated about your dog's behavior. Now, unfortunately, while this may be just one example of the Dodo's failure to explain things in a nuanced or balanced way, it's not the only example. They're also very anti-captivity, perhaps even to a fault. There is no shortage of videos and stories on their site entitled, Someone Rescued ABC Animal from a Zoo, whether it's huskies, bears, tigers, you name it. And that's great that they were rescued from horrible conditions. And I'm not knocking that. And I'm genuinely very happy that these zoos are being exposed and animals are being freed. The only trouble is that the language the Dodo uses to talk about zoos, they've kind of become notoriously anti-captivity. They've also spoken with the founder of Zoo Check and Source Them, which is an anti-zoo, anti-captivity organization while publishing articles about the disturbing truth of where zoo animals come from. And it does paint a gruesome picture, but it doesn't tell the full story. It doesn't discuss the positive impact that zoos have had on conservation, like the San Diego Zoo, which is renowned for its efforts to protect thousands of rare and endangered animals, including over 650 different species and subspecies. Yes, it is true that many zoos are horrific and should be called out, but if the Dodo claims to be an educational tool for all things animal related, then they too should know to use better language that doesn't condemn all zoos, but condemns actions within the bad zoos, Not every animal sanctuary is amazing and not every zoo is a hellhole. But when you consider who the Dodo uses as a source, maybe it's not all that surprising that they can't get their facts straight. And yeah, I'm talking about PETA. And before we take a moment to take a look at the supposed science that the Dodo uses, I'm gonna go ahead and place today's sponsor here just as a little breather. There you go. Here's two to three minutes of breathing space. Self-care is always top of mind for me but in between meditation sessions and trips to the yoga studio or a nail salon, how often are you actually taking care of all your needs? Well, transport your mind to a world where you can relax and treat yourself to your deepest needs with Dipsy. Dipsy is an app full of hundreds of short, sexy audio stories designed by women for women. They bring scenarios to life with immersive soundscapes and realistic characters. And racially inclusive, Dipsy has stories for straight and queer listeners and 56% of stories are voice acted by people of color. New content is released every week. So in between listening to your favorite stories again and again, you can always find something new to explore. And for listeners of the show, Dipsy is offering an extended 30 day free trial when you go to dipsystories.com casket. That's 30 days of full access for free when you go to dipseastories.com slash casket, dipsystories.com slash casket. With Masterclass, you can learn from the world's best minds, anytime, anywhere, and at your own pace. You can learn modern Japanese cooking with Nikki Yakayama, which I highly recommend. You can learn more about wine and learn to appreciate it with wine appreciation courses from James Suckling. And you can learn creativity and leadership with Anna Wintour. Hell, I believe there's even a course right now with Kris Jenner. So for some reason, if you wanna learn something from Kris Jenner, you can do that too. 
With over 180 classes from a range of world-class instructors, that thing you've always wanted to do is closer than you think. Now, I keep talking about Nikki Yakayama's modern Japanese cooking class because it has seriously been one of the best things ever. Aside from the fish thing, which still freaks me out, I did try to rewatch it last week and it just, it wasn't happening for me. I just, I don't know, I can't fillet a fish. I just, it's not for me. But her other classes, especially talking about, you know, just how to kind of organize your space to make sure that you're preparing to prepare your dish the right way and stuff like that has been really helpful and really mindful. And I've been really enjoying that. And the best part about a masterclass experience is that it's not necessary to sit down and consume a full class from start to finish, like right then and there. You can learn in as little as 10 minutes at a time too. I highly recommend checking out Masterclass. This holiday, give one annual membership and get one free. Go to masterclass.com slash casket today. That's masterclass.com slash casket. Terms apply. The dodo frankly sucks at journalism. I know that might sound questionable coming from an internet triangle, but let me explain. They say that the struggle of an animal is adorable. Laugh at a dog high off of pot brownies and post videos of corgis dressed up and competing in games. If they really just wanna focus on the cute little silly videos, that would be one thing. But I need to remind you what their founder said when creating the company, because in case you don't know, here it is. There's a growing readiness and willingness to listen to people speak about issues concerning animals. And the Dodo will provide a home for these kinds of conversations. Do you remember that quote from earlier? But sure, I guess laughing at a dog that could literally fucking die from ingesting chocolate marijuana brownies is a great way to spark that conversation, right? Now their views also frequently fall in line with, you guessed it, PETA. They'll publish articles by Ingrid Newkirk, PETA's founder on their site. I think that anyone who's been around for any length of time, at least kind of listening to my content, you're probably fairly familiar why I dislike the country's largest kill shelter. Excuse me, I meant PETA. That's why I find it wildly hypocritical that anyone claiming to be an advocate for animals would actually stand with them and reference them. I guess I shouldn't be too surprised though, especially when you take a look at how the Dodo presents information. The blog, Why Animals Do the Thing, picks apart their article called, How to Tell if an Animal Sanctuary is Fake, and it is an absolute nightmare. They say that sanctuaries shouldn't breed animals on purpose or allow guests to come in contact with residents, both important points. But then they turn around and write, wild animals aren't obedient and usually can't be trained without negative reinforcement, which means whips, shackles, food deprivation, or other questionable methods, even if the keepers tell you otherwise. And that's patently untrue. Wild animals won't be domesticated overnight. That's a long selective breeding process that humans did with dogs and livestock and other animals. But taming a wild animal doesn't mean you have to fucking starve it. Shouldn't the dodo know this considering they've got so many videos of wild beavers and birds living in people's houses? If you're as alarmed by this quote as I am and click on the link they use as a source for information, you'll actually find that it links to another dodo article about an abusive zoo. I guess because one zoo used these horrific methods, it means all zoos and sanctuaries do too. Not only is the dodo using themselves as a source, which is funny in of itself, but it also doesn't even seem like a relevant source in the first place. And I just, how do you source yourself and then source yourself incorrectly too? That's just comical. And this actually happens on numerous occasions, only two and just two out of their 21 in-text link sources go anywhere aside from another Dodo page. Not only do they surround fact with misinformation, but they miss gigantic pieces of relevant information too. This Dodo article is supposed to be about how to tell the difference between a real sanctuary and a scam, right? So then how come their article completely fails to mention the Global Federation of Animal Sanctuaries, an accrediting agency whose literal job it is to do this? As the blog, Why Animals Do the Thing points out, this massive oversight shows that the author, and in my opinion, the dodo themselves, know so little about this topic that their research really shouldn't be trusted. Out of curiosity to see if the dodo was still doing this, I clicked on one of their most recent articles about pet health, a topic where it's very important to get your facts right. And here's what I found. Their first link led to another dodo article. Their second led to Dodo Vet, their new 24 seven vet care service. Since it's new, I can't really comment on it yet, but needless to say, I'm really concerned it exists in the first place. The fourth, fifth, sixth, and seventh source also all led back to the Dodo, three of which led to different viral videos. The article was discussing which dog breeds are most at risk for DCM, a heart condition. Rather than back their information up with studies, the Dodo found it more pertinent to show you cute videos of those breeds instead. 
The eighth link led to the dodo. The ninth went to a study posted by the FDA. So congratulations, an outside source. But then the 10th and 11th all went back to the dodo. So just one link, one went to a study, just one single link, less than 10% supported what the dodo was saying with outsourcing itself. And no, unfortunately, it's not as if this study answered every question brought up in the article too. It's not as if all the information you really needed was there all along. The dodo either wants you to trust them wholeheartedly, or they really don't care if you struggle to get your hands on health information for your beloved pet. It's like an absolute cycle too. You could click on a dodo article to educate yourself and then end up in a different article they source and keep repeating that loop endlessly just because they won't stop linking themselves. I cannot tell you how absolutely frustrating it was in the research process to have to keep going back to links of themselves. And worse yet, I can't imagine how even more frustrating it must be for someone who's actually looking for correct information about their pets and they just keep getting thrown into this cycle. Now, we've got one more thing left to talk about today, and that's the devastating effect that can come from the dodo when people try to emulate their content. We've touched upon it briefly. Commenters claim that they too have tried to rescue wildlife, but often because they're just not knowledgeable enough, they fail and the animal might die. Unfortunately, there are also those that will try to record it because, hey, maybe they can make some money too. Put a Burmese python in a cage with a gibbon just so they could come in and rescue the gibbon in the nick of time. So yeah, putting animals in danger for the sake of recording fake fucking rescue videos, that's a thing that is real apparently. And while I can't say I'm surprised, I'm definitely disappointed and infuriated. To be clear, the dodo is not directly responsible, nor are they necessarily promoting fake rescues. However, YouTube normalizing the exotic pet trade and interactions between humans and wild animals does bear some level of responsibility here. The dodo set the stage. They made these clickable, easy to digest, perfectly happy ending stories. Now, fake rescuers have swooped in to continue to meet that demand. And personally, I do think that the dodo could make a serious positive change. If they started educating the public and making a push for factually accurate information in their videos, then maybe, just maybe, commenters could see the dangers in the fake videos too. But unfortunately, and for the time being, they seem to care more about clicks and views than that. I just wish they would prove me wrong. But with all of that being said, that is where we're ending today's episode of The Corporate Casket. I can't say I hope you enjoyed it, but I do hope that you did learn something today. And if you did, make sure that you're liking, following, and subscribing to stay up to date on all the latest episodes. Thank you so much for joining me. Have a great weekend, and I'll see you in the next one. 